Welcome to the EI Guru podcast, a podcast completely focused on emotional intelligence. Typically, the first question I get is, what is emotional intelligence? In very simple terms, it's how we manage our emotions in our interactions with ourselves and others. Or put another way, it's being in the right state and not being in a state when under pressure. Emotional intelligence is another label for mindset. And we all know that when navigating those important conversations, we need to tap into our best. I'll be interviewing leaders and experts in this ever expanding field and sharing the data on why emotional intelligence is the difference that makes the difference in all of our relationships. Remember to share and subscribe to the EI Guru podcast. And if you have any questions, you can post them once you've subscribed. So good morning and welcome to the EI Guru podcast. This is the first episode of many. And uh, today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Joe Maddox, who I've known for just over 20 years now. And um, we'll be talking all things around emotional intelligence. And uh, one of the first questions we typically get asked is, what is emotional intelligence? And my nutshell sort of take on emotional intelligence is, it's a new label that's been around for some time now. But basically, it's your mindset. And how do you handle yourself under pressure and in relationships with your personal uh, relationships and also your professional relationships? So I'm, as I say, I'm really delighted to to have Joe on board in the in a number of series, actually. This is the first episode, of course. And uh, Joe's going to be doing a deep dive into emotional intelligence, the framework that he uh, came up with some 25 years ago, maybe even more than 25 years ago. But I'm going to be asking Joe to introduce himself. So, um, Joe, I, I'm, I'm really fascinated. I mean, I've known you for a long time now, but I'm not sure we've ever really deep dived into your background. So um, maybe it would be good just to hear, you know, a bit about you, what got you into psychology, and then, you know, maybe then from there onwards, if you can, if you don't mind, yeah, Joe. Yeah. Well, thanks for inviting me to be part of your, well, your first podcaster for this series. And as you say, Jim, we've known each other for 20 years and our history goes back originally from the psychology side. Um, and then that picture behind you, you're the guy got me into endurance <laughs> events and cycling across America. <laughs> anyway, we can talk about that another time and then eventually doing Land's End, John and Groats, all sorts of things. But uh, we have a lot of shared interests and I think they do overlap when, when you're talking about endurance, resilience, emotional intelligence. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Yeah, I mean, I my background, um, tends to how far you want to go back. Um, my, my first interest, say, in psychology comes from uh, school days, actually. I just started reading books and, you know, I just really did wonder what I was going to do for the rest of my life, my career. And I got the big, thick Ucker handbook. I don't know if you still got them. Because wow. you know, I, I didn't want to get a job. So I thought, I'll make sure I get to university and have another three years to avoid, avoid all that. <laughs> And I went through it. Everyone at my school seemed to do business. This was back in the 80s. I suppose people did business studies and um, IT as it was then. I just wasn't my thing particularly. And I, I looked at psychology was available. Now you have to get three A's and be super clever. But in those days, you could kind of squeeze in. If you're interested in it, you get somewhere. Anyway, that's what got my interest. And it stayed with me for, you know, for, um, you know 54 now, so 30 odd years. And then I went to university, uh, London Goldsmiths, then to Cardiff, uh, did my master's in occupational psychology. And when I was there, I met a guy called John Cooper. Uh, many people know John, a real charismatic guy. We're the same age and um, we got a job together at a careers guidance company. And literally the rest is history. A year later, we set up a company called JCA, John Cooper Associates. And um, we, we started applying psychology as, you know, very young to be setting up our own business. But we spent 25 years working together. I always say we outlasted our own wives. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it was a long relationship with its ups and downs, uh, but mostly and invariably really good. And we're still best, best friends. And we, you know, work and talk together a lot, even though we're, we're you know, doing our own thing a bit. <clears throat> anyway, I, I just just mentioned that because 
it's that's a lot of that are the origins of the emotional intelligence stuff. It wasn't called emotional intelligence back then, back in the 90s, really, when we started 1993. So we're on, a, you know, 30 years ago. And in fact, if you mentioned emotions in the workplace, it was sort of frowned upon. I thought, well, you know, we don't do that. You know, can you can you talk about cognition or something? <laughs> Com competencies. Um, it was more about performance, wasn't it? It was really focused on. You know, was, what's, what's the bottom line what are your figures yeah you know? yeah and it's still i suppose it still is but what creates that people are now you know 20 it wasn't that much you know 20 years ago people started realizing actually emotions do make a difference but john and i you know we ended up going to um america and working with a guy called will schutz yes he, he developed Firo theory which is about interpersonal relations and he, he was one of the guys who set up the self-esteem movement back in the uh back in the 60s in california Wow, this what this this person's doing is just where we're at, and we want to be doing that in the UK. But it it was a different different mindset. I mean, it's caught up now. Now we're yeah. still talking mental health, well being is well recognised, but not back then. I'm um, in the workplace. So yeah, we did workshops, encounter groups, all sorts of weird and wonderful things uh, with Will Schutz, and we came back, and you know, John being the persuasive person he was, he managed to get the the franchise to to run human element workshops, which is part of the FIRO that you might have heard of FIRO. Yeah, no, I, I, was, I was lucky enough, Joe, to come along and do the human element uh, program with you. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I found that fascinating. And, you know, that was where I got deeper involved in working with you guys, but also um, it really convinced me that emotional intelligence was it for me. And mm. Yeah, so sorry, I interrupted you there. No, I, I just really, I mean, you've experienced that. And I think you have to, you do have to experience this stuff to, to appreciate it. And that's one of my bed bugs about, about emotional intelligence, the way it's practiced. I think we learn about it, but we don't experience it. And mm -hmm. Schutz was very much about experiential. So he was essentially saying that feelings drive behavior. And until you get into the feelings bit, you're not really understanding where the behavior is coming from. And that's what this, as you know, you know, Jim, that the human element workshop was all about that, really getting beneath the surface, which became a whole theme for me and John in the work that we do. Um, uh, I mean, Schutz was 50 years ahead of his time. He, he developed a lot of this stuff in, in um, 1958, uh, <laughs> you know, during the Korean War, he was working with submarine crews and, you know anyway you, you can read about that another time but it, it really inspired me and he was one of the persons who did that um, his his book the human element is yeah uh, it's a great book to read as well for yeah. our listeners that uh, are really interested in reading that you know that's a it's a really good background read for where some of your thinking was shaped in the early days absolutely absolutely and he talked about like layers of an onion and, and you'll know the framework which we're going to talk about you know it starts with you know a self-concept he described it as we call it attitude the self you know how do you see yourself and then that feeds on to uh it, that influences how we feel and think and then that drives much of our behavior and during the human element program you go through those different layers and then we started accommodating that to the business world with ei and you really unpeel those layers in in many of the workshops and in the instrument that we're going to talk about the what what became the emotional intelligence profile yeah so tell me tell me a little bit more about so i, I we've got the history the listeners have got your history about what got you into psychology and you know you went off and did your degree etc then you started um a business with uh, john john cooper what I'm interested in is how that then evolved, you know, so then what happened next? Because you, you, you know, you, you developed your own framework and model. Yeah. So, I mean, that was just one of the influences. So yeah, we set up the business and we had this strap line. It's, and this is really what we believed in. And we were quite different, I suppose, when we, when we developed JCA, it was about getting the best out of people in a sustainable way. And that the difference there was very much, I mean, most companies did assessment mainly and not so much in psychology, not much that much development, but we were about sustainable change. And we used a lot of tools like Myers-Briggs, 16PF, and I you know, still use them. I think they're brilliant personality tools, but there's a so, bit of a, hmm, after you've been, you know, so what factor, how do I manage this? What do I do about it? I'm, you know, an ENFP or I've got this extroversion trait. Can I change it? Do I want to change it? How do I... And that's what got us into, well, actually, you can manage your personality. Yeah. Um, and this, 
later became our model of emotional intelligence. So how do you manage your personality and how do you make it sustainable? Mm -hmm. And again, it took us back to the, the human element work of getting beneath the surface, because I think you could change people's behavior, give them the right techniques and skills, but doesn't make them necessarily stay that way. And a good example of that was we used to work a lot in the career sector with young people. And we put them up, we do a load of skills training and, you know, sure enough, the, the youngsters would improve for a while, but then they go back to their old habits very quickly, particularly when they're back in the classroom with their mates and then they kind of forget about it. And what age um, group are you talking about there? Then, oh, 16, school leaver yeah. age. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, teenage years, uh, particularly, although we applied it later to, to really young, younger kids, bub bubblers, we call them, for the, what they call derailed. Yeah. So this is a foundation really to later the work we did with adults and actually you know people are the people um yeah. but if you can get them earlier you can make a big difference so we were we, uh, we so we, this was in the days that there's quite a bit more funding for career support in the education sector yeah. and we developed something well uh, you know along with john we developed something called maps and the, the key to this was uh making stopping turning behavior change into habitual change yeah. And we did this by going a little bit beneath the surface and focusing on their attitudes. And we focused on five areas that we identified as blockers to them getting on apprenticeships or staying in employment and things like that. And there's five reasons we identified why people dropped out, which is never really the big problem. Motivation, ambition, adaptability, perseverance and self-esteem. So, so we call it MAPS. Yep. And we dealt a sort of indicator that worked really well because actually it took a bit longer to work with the individuals but it made a more sustainable change we actually got results where individuals stayed on their apprenticeships they completed them they stayed in employment they overcame the setbacks and the adversity wow. uh, they were more motivated and it was really great so that was a sort of you know a, a big eye opener for, for us and what we did at jca was actually if we want to make change that sticks then you have to start looking at not just behavior and skills and competencies you have to get beneath the surface yeah and maps was our you know the foundation to that which later really was the foundation to the eip and the emotional intelligence model yeah wow how exciting uh, to be involved mm. in young kids you know where you can make a significant difference you know as you say the earlier that you get them the better. It, it really sort of rings true to a lot of our stuff that we as adults struggle with and grapple with tends to be, you know, related back to our childhood, our early childhood. And that's not about blaming the parents as such. It's just about understanding what shaped us into who we are today. And, um, uh, you know, that's why I find this absolutely fascinating and um, why I'm so passionate about emotional intelligence being the difference that makes the difference, yeah. not just in the corporate world, in our personal relationships as well. I'll just add, Jim, I mean, the, the, the concept of emotional intelligence really comes from the education sector, you know, emotional literacy, as, as it was called in those yeah. days, and um, helping young people identify their emotions um, label them accurately and, and so forth um, but it seems to you know it seems to have gone now to the you know we're talking about leadership <clears throat> really to the top one percent of the population and how can we make a small difference and I you know I do a lot of work in that sector with you Jim but um, the bigger difference is I find the people who really have struggled with emotional intelligence um, and and the younger generation as well people are still working out how to manage their behavior how to manage their emotions yeah um and we had you know uh, just one example of that is working with um you know individuals who are from the stem sector the science technology uh, maths and they tend to be a far more linear thinkers yeah uh, some might be on the aspergic spectrum but we've worked with these deep scientists and we've had tremendous success in shifting their emotional intelligence because once they buy into the concept uh, the neuroscience and the hard numbers behind it, then they'll embrace it, um, we, we found. And they're the individuals who make life transforming changes in their behavior and, and relationships, not just in work, but their, their lives more generally. As did the young people, once they embrace some of these ideas and realize they could get on better with their mates or chat to girls or boys better or whatever it is they want to do, <laughs> um, or not get told off by the teachers and find life just a bit easier. 
That's I quite, mean, I, that's we, quite we, funny. We, <laughs> you know this better than I. You've got many children. My son's 20, but I've been through this the last few years. and Just such a crucial time to help people, youngsters, understand why they feel and behave as they do. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's the pressure on the latest generation. You know, your son's a great example of, you know, the latest generation of, goodness me, they, we didn't have to deal with all this social media stuff and, um, you know... Uh, it was the school dance and you know i i love the fact that actually had i known all this stuff then i think i was pretty okay with being able to talk to others especially girls uh, as i was growing up but it would be such a cool thing to have had some of this stuff at school yeah. and of course schools are starting to very slowly 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 getting there yeah. with introducing um stuff around emotional intelligence you know um I've done a very small amount of free talks to school teachers, but I'm not seeing it, you know, really grab yet um, in the in the in the school in the educational sector. But you know that there's room for well, of course, yeah. there's room for improvement there. Yeah, yeah. I think there's just um, <clears throat> you know, like we all understand the lack of funding and resource and time. But yeah, when we worked. I know we need to talk more about the business world and stuff, but this does, is the origins of emotional intelligence. Yeah. And if you can, if you can apply it, literally took, we took the same model and we applied it to adults and top leaders and chief executives and the, the whole gamut. And we found that people are people. We all have the fundamental same needs. And in fact, a lot of the, the chinks, the derailers, the team roles that people adopt, are historically related to how they play they were in the playground or how they were with their parents and other things i'm not suggesting we, you do psychoanalysis or go hard no. back to people's but if people understand why they get triggered uh, what's going on for them then they'd be far better able to start recognizing it in their adult lives and choose make a choice is this something i want to continue doing or could things be different for me yeah and I think that's the that's the interesting thing here with emotional intelligence is there is choice. It's about awareness. The first step is awareness mm. and awareness of the patterns of behavior that we're running. Mm. And, you know, I, I'll put my hand up straight away and say there's a lot of occasions where I, I'm operating out of awareness. In fact, you know, uh, I remember a, a long time ago, a, a spiritual teacher was talking about um, most of us on the planet are sleepwalking through our lives, you know, yeah, and we're yeah. not aware of the fingerprint that we're leaving in every interaction. So it's yeah. about those uh, situations and being aware of, okay, so what are, what are the patterns of behavior that I'm running? And we don't ever get that until we have feedback from others. You know, mm -hmm. if you brush up against someone that thinks that you're quite abrupt, you know, mm -hmm. and if they're, if they're good enough, they'll give you feedback and say, yeah, I'm not particularly sure I liked how you said that or how you handled that. And then you can become aware. But without yeah. the awareness, you continue yes. to bang into things and to people. Yeah. Yeah. And it's an interesting cycle. And one, one I think we miss often, I think with emotional intelligence, we get, I mean, most of what we do is habitual automatic behaviors. We don't concentrate on every emotion we have and every action we behave because it's too much effort. Yeah. And that's why we have... <laughs> That's simply why we have attitudes and habits, because the brain can't deal with everything that goes on all the time. So we, we everything, most of what we do is going to be attitudinal driven behavior, at, habitual. So if you're not, if you ignore that stuff, then then you're going to be ignoring most of what you do. Um, yeah. <laughs> so how do you how do you address that? How do you shift it? And yeah. it is through, as you say, Jim, recognizing, noticing, being aware, but then making the change and then creating new or automatic responses. Yes. Um, ways of behaving yeah and i think ai does really well on the on the activity bit but doesn't actually focus how do you then transfer that into habits yes um, and that's and when we come to our, our framework with this model that this is where i think it differentiates because it's got i call it dual processing you can do the conscious route or the automatic route and ideally you want to yeah. eventually turn things back to the automated mm. but then of course after time you might find you're making mistakes or these habits aren't working or you're playing out old old defensive responses and you need to revisit and say oh yeah somebody told us i was a bit abrupt or I was a bit something else that i don't feel comfortable with i need to go back and check in with myself yes um do some coaching whatever might help you yeah look again at those 
responses. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, I, as I said, I don't get it right all the time myself. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a perfect, I'm not the finished article by any stretch. No. Um, and you can ask my two ex-wives uh, and they'll, <laughs> they'll tell you for sure that that's the case. And my kids will all also vouch for that, by the way. I've read um, your book, Jim. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very carefully. Which, um, <laughs> But, you know, it's, it, that's what you've done more than most people I know is self-exploration and insight, um, yeah. understanding um, of what's going on. And, you know, it, is, it doesn't mean it solves everything, but it's, it, it's better. It's more it's helpful. You know? Yeah. You can yeah. make, as you say, you can choose then what you want to do rather than ignorantly just, you know, putting up with stuff or being very defensive and assuming everyone else is wrong. Mm. I mean, it's it's funny. I mean, you know me pretty well, but uh, other other friends that are close to me as well. And I joke about it myself, actually, um, about Mr. Magoo. And of course, most of the listeners um, will be of the age where they'll remember the cartoon character, Mr. Magoo, who mm. was operating out of awareness most of his time mm. i mean he had those bottle rim glasses that uh, and he was typically his uh the, the the cartoon that i remember he you know he's he's driving along in his old you know car you know chugging along in traffic but actually um he's free of traffic he, he's leading the traffic there's disaster behind him so there's chaos behind him that he has actually created and he's yeah. not aware of the yeah. The, the chaos that he's created and he's happily driving away and that's yeah. what happens with all of us we're happily driving away you know walking through life thinking that we're okay but actually you know there's a there's chaos carnage in the background that we've created and we've caused so yeah um, mr mr magoo yeah, I mean, yeah I i've mean, forgotten about that one no, i just and, i remember he'd, he'd be normally on a building site walking along a plank of wood that goes up on a crane and then he, yeah. you think oh he's gonna <laughs> fall to his death and he walks to another piece of wood that exactly he always seems to get away with it that's yeah out of awareness out of awareness and yeah. sometimes actually being out of awareness is bliss it is bliss yeah. and he was blissful he was in a happy state he was never upset yeah. about stuff yeah I, I suppose yeah. the point is you know choicefulness and you may say actually i don't really want to be uh i don't know going to a dentist or something i don't really want to be that aware of what's going on no, of um, course some people yeah. do it's just knowing i'm making my choices i don't really want to think about this right now um it's too painful or yeah, no, whenever yeah. I go to a dentist, I, um, <laughs> I, I, I actually predetermine that I'm probably going to at least get a, an injection and, and prepare myself for the injection. And actually, the injection is never as bad as I actually think it in my head. Yeah. So, you know, pe before I go there, that's mm. this great big six foot dagger that's going to go into my mouth and come up the side of my head. It's never that bad. But, you know, the thinking that I do before it, I sort of Absolutely. wind myself into a state of frenzy. A bit like when I go for a swim in the sea, I'm always thinking or I'm always listening to the Jaws music and yeah, I'm yeah. terrified of sharks, yeah. even in the UK. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's... And I'm thinking, oh, that was that little sort of wave, was that a shark's fin? You know, and, a, and that that's that's even... So when you're doing your triathlon, it must be a nightmare before you get out of the water and do your bike side say <laughs> well i suppose the only saving grace for me is that i don't typically train in a lot of seawater uh, uh, so i'm not out swimming by myself so yeah. that's that's good for me when i'm in a race i think mm, i'd be really unlucky actually out of yeah. two thousand people that are starting yeah. an iron man yeah. um to be bitten by <laughs> a shark if there is one it's yeah. worth pointing out, Jim. You, 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 your background in Australia, so you're more. This is true stuff. Yes, so. yes, it's real. It's real. Yeah, and, yeah. and you know, the shark alarm did go off quite a bit when we were at yeah. the beach. You know, so um, yeah. I mean, just, just the thought how you know, in terms of emotional intelligence, our brain is. You know, we might talk about this in another another podcast about our, how our brain operates, but it's it's an it's there to anticipate risk essentially and to keep us yeah. safe and alive. So, its primary objective is to scan the environment for potential dangers and <laughs> it can be oversensitized and yeah mine was <laughs> but that's what the, that's what happens when we get into the emotional hijack or uh, yeah. you know uh, going for a difficult meeting or worrying about talking to somebody it's the emotions are often you call them expectations they're there to tell us oh watch out this is going to happen yeah so if we oversensitize or we don't manage them effectively we let the emotions just take over then they actually interfere with our capacity to perform effectively. Yeah. And that's, a, you know, you, what you don't want is 
when you're in a race to, you know, like you did loads of Ironmans, you don't want to be burning all your adrenaline in the first 10 minutes because you're terrified of a shark attack. It's probably not going to happen. Yeah, it's, it's, it is. And it? it's managing your emotional state so you can, you know, um, be perform at your best for the goal that you want to achieve. Yeah. And actually, that that's sort of what I talk about when I'm talking about um, explaining emotional intelligence. It's, it is about, it's a new label that, and when I say new, it's been around for 25, 30 years now that, you know, Goldman, i um, not quite sure how far back he goes, but he came out with his book, Emotional Intelligence. Mm. Uh, and I know we're going to talk about your book at some point uh, mm. during this particular episode, Emotional Intelligence at Work, but yeah, it's about mindset, you know, what sort of mindset and, and athletes of, you know, exceptional athletes, you know, the Olympians, the world class athletes, they there is a mindset that they can tap into when they need it most. So under mm -hmm. pressure, mm -hmm. how do they perform under pressure when they really need it, when they're mm -hmm. looking to try and win gold medal mm -hmm. after years and years of training? Mm -hmm. Can they manage their state so that their best can show up? Because mm -hmm. that is the difference that makes the difference. You know, yeah. they've all done the weights in the gym and the repetitions that they might have to do in the pool, but it's their ability to access their ability, their mindset or their emotional mm -hmm. intelligence, mm -hmm. which is the bit that makes the difference. And, yeah. and as you've already spoken, it's the same in the corporate world. It's the same yeah. in our personal yeah. relationships. Yeah. And we access our best, our best version of ourselves mm -hmm. under pressure, under stress, or do we, as you said earlier, you know, do we knee jerk to our, you know, like a, yeah. what I call a hissy fit, you know, you know, we go into a meltdown, yeah. see red and go, yeah. you know, and, and bleat out a load of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. aren't appropriate, which yeah. we don't really necessarily mean, but it's our defense mechanism. Yeah. I mean, you've worked with elite athletes and, you know, gold medalists and I know, I know but I think they're, you know, a good example of individuals who focus on a particular objective, and they've managed everything about themselves, their body, their mind, their training, their nutrition, everything for four years to get to that point, probably yeah. a lot longer. And that's phenomenal. When you look at some of the aspects we talk about later in what is a goal directing as personal power, they've, they've orientated everything to achieve their goal and their, their mindset. Another word for attitude, I'd say, yeah. uh, managing is, um, is phenomenally strong. Having said that, very often they get to that point, they've done that, and their mindset has been on one single objective, um, and yet they've not thought about other things that, you know, we live for a long time. Yes. And there are other things in our lives we might want to do as well. Yeah. And suddenly it's a bit of a, a wake-up call. So it's that continuous cycle of, okay, got there, let's go back, revisit awareness awareness time before putting it into action. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, cycle, there's a cycle part to this, and there isn't a sort of, tick the box completed i'm i'm all done no 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 definitely not no. definitely not <laughs> uh i continue to get the lessons they can they come along you know uh, yeah. when it, when you just think you got it sorted yeah. something comes along and you surprise yourself with how yeah. you have showed up in a certain situation yeah but joe um we could just talk endlessly about stuff what i mm. what i'd really like to understand is how you came about the the model we keep on talking about a model but uh, be before we get into the model, mm -hmm. give me your version of what is, you know, so I've given you a sort of a mm -hmm. little snapshot mm -hmm. of what I think mm -hmm. emotional intelligence is. Mm -hmm. But give me your uh, expert view, your view and opinion on what emotional yeah. intelligence is. Describe that for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I generally start by using the term emotional intelligence and saying it literally is the intelligent use of your emotions. So it's, you know, the two words are there for a reason. Yeah. Intelligent thinking. Uh, emotions feeling thinking about your feelings okay so yeah hmm, i'm not really some people just don't ever do that no, they um, don't. until they come so strong that they can't avoid them what's going on for me i can't control it you know you look at young youngsters who lose emotional control it's often they, these things just happen to you i don't know what's going on but even you know adults of course you know the examples is, is the red mist you know it gets to extreme but a large part of emotional intelligence is noticing feelings sooner Okay. If I can just pick up, oh, I feel a little bit anxious about this. So this present, this conversation, I might notice a little bit of nervousness. Oh, actually, all I need to do is just chat with Jim and he'll relax me or have a few deep breaths and I'll calm down. I've done things before, practice them. They're good habits. I can replay them. Yeah. 
But if I didn't notice that and I let it build up, maybe I would, you know, not feel that like, it would interfere with my thinking and my uh, have a talk, whatever. So, you know, large, a large part of it is noticing your feeling, thinking about your feelings and then to guide your behavior. But of course, it's not just about yourself. You know, a lot of EI is about relationships. But if I can manage my own feelings, then it's easier to manage my relationships as well. So um, I can converse better with, with you when I'm feeling relaxed and when I'm feeling tense and worried or thinking about my own stuff and not concentrating on you. Yeah. And you'll know that as a coach, you know, the worst thing to do is get preoccupied with what am I going to what am I going to do rather than who's the person in front of me? Yeah. So I think it's yeah, it's that that's a very practical definition there's a lot more to it but thinking about your feelings to guide your behavior and thinking about other people's feelings to notice theirs and manage your relationships effectively yeah yeah nice it's um, love it's, it's yeah. interesting that you say that you know i i always think about the heebie-jeebies you know if, if you're uncomfortable you get the heebie-jeebies or the yips mm. or you know you're, you're just nervous mm. so before an yeah. important presentation or yeah. you know, a race that you might be doing you know, it's mm. that and managing those effectively. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If I give you another um, way of describing it, you talked about, um, you know, Mr. Magoo driving along and all that kind of stuff. Just reminded me of my car metaphor for emotional intelligence, which uh -huh. is, you know, um, when you, well, before you even get, my, my son learned to drive a couple of years ago and I was teaching, uh, you know, uh, I, I dared to be the teacher because <laughs> it was during COVID. There was no you know teachers around so that's that's that really bra that's brave that's pretty brave I'll tell you what, i learned more about my emotional intelligence and <laughs> <laughs> i just had to calm down i was completely wrong everything i did and uh anyway. was it in your own car or was, it, was in my car, yeah, it was in my oh, own my car God. we just went to a, a quiet road this is the very first time and you know william he just wanted to get on and do it <clears throat> okay i'll let you make your mistakes but um by the way he passed so he did did great eventually Fantastic. but um the first thing i said like you know being a boring old dad i said actually before we get in the car let's have a look around it and you know just check the tires are right windscreen's clear the you know the oil and all the all the things you have to maintain oh my god i would have been so frustrated boring. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly yeah um well the, the reason i say that is, is at least as a metaphor for emotional intelligence it starts by looking after so if your your body is the car and you've got to maintain it look after it and if you don't, it'll go for a while, but then it'll start to fall to pieces and you'll eventually have a big catastrophic collapse. And you'll have to call in the AA or, and, and, you know, somebody will help you get help, but it'll take time to recover and rebuild a car, you know. But if you maintain it, it'll last a lot longer and it'll do what it wants. So that's the first thing. It's, it's the bottom of this model is well-being, maintenance, paying attention to yourself, your, yeah. your vehicle in this case. And then, of course, William learned to drive his car and, um, you know, it was clunky, he made lots of mistakes, stalling and so forth, but he got better. And the great thing about AI is, it, is with practice, we can improve it. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. not the same as personality, which is pretty fixed. I'm, I'm an introvert. I'm always going to be an introvert. I don't actually want to change that, but I want to manage it. I want to be able to do extrovert things and vice yeah. versa. So you can learn to improve your skills. You listen to the engine, like you pay attention to your body. You notice what's going on in the car. You learn, auto and everything becomes automated, doesn't it? After yes. time, you become so skilled, you don't even think about it. The same with AI. With practice, a lot of it will be habitual. Yeah, no, I like that. Yeah, and that's and that's. So I think that's about managing what you've got, your potential resources. Um, and the, you know, one other part to that is when you, you know, so William became a you know pretty good driver, and he got so confident you know, zooming around corners and eventually he had his, his accident, as you do, a bit of whiplash and bump, bumping around about. I said, well, it's judgment, okay? There's another element to this. You're a brilliant driver, you're very skillful, but your judgment's not there. You've not yet had that experience. And yeah. that comes through wisdom. And it comes through also noticing your surroundings and anticipating things. So on the roads, you know, you don't know what's gonna sort of, somebody will come, come into you and, you know, other bad drivers, and it's not necessarily your fault, but if you preempt and expect things might not work out or work out what could be around a corner. So this is your awareness of others. So it's not yeah. just about your skills. It's about noticing your environment, your surroundings, having anticipations. Remember, the brain is a pattern matching organ. It's there yeah. to anticipate and predict what's going to happen next. And it's the same thing in driving. A good driver will be somebody who, you know, anticipates and knows, their, you know, the road traffic 
and it, you know is, is ready for most things but of course yeah. there will be things you can't prepare for and there will be setbacks and then you have to just take stock slow down and deal with it yeah i love that i love that analogy that's a, a beautiful metaphor analogy especially the uh, awareness of others piece you know um that's that's pretty cool might might nick that from you a little bit joe <laughs> That I, I typically when it, yeah. yeah no but I typically when I'm talking about emotional intelligence and the framework which we'll, mm. I know we're going to get into but when I typically talk about that I talk about the fun, the fundamental foundation piece which is the um, the attitudinal piece that you've spoken about I talk about that as as though you're building a house or a, a building so the foundation is the concrete so they dig a big hole and fill it with concrete. Now, if that, that foundation has to be level, so um, making sure that that foundation is solid and level, and then you can build on top of that. So from yeah. there, you can build. And um, I look at them when I look at the model, that's the the way I think about it and share it with leaders that I've worked with. And, and as you know, I've been lucky over the last 20 years to have worked with hundreds of senior leaders around this framework mm. and their teams. And I, I, yeah, and I, I think that's a nice you know physical ex picture of what you're doing isn't it? if you can get those bedrock foundations uh, address those and everything else is much easier to build on yeah a lot a lot a lot easier okay so 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 now uh, having explained your what is emotional intelligence tell me a little bit about how you got into developing this model and how that came about and and so on well, I suppose that does go back to uh, the work with um, a map. So I'd come, you know, I, I described how we looked at attitudes um, and those were very successful. And actually with more time, you can make a much bigger impact that's sustainable. So that was called the maps indicator. And then I met a guy called Tim Sparrow. Uh, Tim was a psychotherapist, still is. And he was very much the expert on emotions. I was, I suppose, more of an expert on behavior attitude and measurement and he was um yeah very very inspirational man to me i learned an awful lot from him he was somewhat older than me wiser than me he had trained in uh, uh transactional analysis so he's a therapist and we just spent a lot of time talking about ideas and he said look i've read this book by dan goldman it was back in 1995 why EQ matters more than IQ. And he said, this is kind of what I do in my practice in a therapeutic way, help people understand their emotions, that drive their behavior. And, you know, I think, you know, the work that you do, Joe, I've heard what you're doing. With I think we could do something here around emotional intelligence, working with groups. I thought, yeah, I was thinking the same thing, really. I've, I've been thinking about, I've, you know, becoming mildly popular back in the early, mid nineties. Yeah. And, um, but so I just wanted to work with this person because, you know, I just learned so much from him. Um, so we started, the way he liked to do it was go to a pub, drink beer and have cheese. And that's what we did for, or go to his house and we you know, just talk and write down things. And then we, we deliberately said, let's develop a tool for working with groups of people. Um, I was also influenced by uh, working with Will Schutz, who was, a, was yeah. all about group work. And we developed a questionnaire called the team. What do we call it? It's changed now. So it's called team effectiveness. Okay. At the time, uh, it's called the team emotional intelligence profile now. Yeah. But that was the first instrument we developed because we wanted to work with groups and make a, make an impact. And we ran a couple of workshops. We got a lot of feedback and thought, yeah, this is really good. But it's much harder to get interest um, or people to buy into a teamwork team product than it was say an individual yeah. so why don't you know can we have something people ask us can we have something working with individuals as well so we took the sort of model and we um, adapted it a bit and essentially we came up with the individual effectiveness questionnaire uh, yeah. ie in fact i think it's called idq originally individual diagnostic questionnaire but this is you know going back 25 years now and we had various iterations of it. We developed quite a few theoretical approaches and they're all drawing upon humanistic psychology. Some of yep. it was transactional analysis, gestalt, uh, human element. Uh, there's a lot of neuroscience research going on at the time as well, uh, which is very clearly showing that 
Um, this is work of Joseph Ledoux, The Emotional Brain, Candice Pert, Molecules yep. of Emotion, and Antonio Damasio, uh, I, you know, the um, Descartes era. There's really good books at that, at that time. And they're fundamentally saying that feelings are there prior to our thinking. And if you want to manage your thinking stuff, you need to manage your feeling stuff first. Yeah. So that influenced it. And all these humanistic approaches, we came up with eight principles. Or you call them mindsets um, yeah. or attitudes. These were the foundations to the questionnaire. If and the, the bottom line was when people adopt these mindsets, then they're more likely to behave in emotionally intelligent ways. And when people behave in ways that are not emotionally intelligent, the chances are they'll be breaching one or more of these principles. Right, okay. And I mean, this was things like um, each of us has potential for growth. You know, um, we have orientation towards growth. People can change. And, you know, it's rather like the growth mindset stuff that's become popular yeah. now. Um, however you are and I am is okay. So fundamental acceptance of yourself. So all the scales we developed after then were linked to these eight principles. Ah, uh, clever. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then we, you know, from TA, we took the OK Corral model, um, yes. which we can talk about. And the foundation to this, as you say, that the, the fundamental building block was my self-concept and my attitude towards others generally, self-regard and, and regard towards others in the world yeah. and everything feeds upwards from there and fundamentally mm -hmm. i i think it's a stroke of genius that you both came up with this as the foundation of your model because mm. I, I i need to say this and i do say it all the time mm. is that the the framework is the only framework that looks at self-regard and regard for others it's mm. the only one on the planet so your mm. question the questionnaire that you uh, developed is the only questionnaire that looks at your self-regard and regard for others. So I'm really interested to get you to explain to our listeners more in more detail the six core framework that you came up with, but then we'll yep. dive into yep. Yep. Uh, a bit of explanation around self-regard, how that's shaped, and also regard for others, how that's mm. shaped as mm. well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so those were, I mean, the, the, the core, we had eight mindset attitudes. And the first one was, however you are and others are, is okay. So yes. uh, unconditional acceptance comes from Carl Rogers' work. And it fits also with the work of Will Schutz, the self-concept, self-esteem that he called it. But essentially the same, the same stuff. It's been around for, you know, decades, of course, yes. um, humanistic psychology. But we brought it together. We fitted it with the neuroscience and we put this framework together. And of course, Goldman was talking about a similar model, but he put it in, I mean, you know, Tim Sparrow was at one of the very early conferences with Dan Goldman, and he was talking about his model, that, you know, the four boxes yes. are quite well known. Yeah, yeah. And, he, and Tim pointed out, actually, is it a cycle or is it come from the bottom upwards? And yes. actually, we said, actually, things are different. Anyway, that was just an, an anecdote from the very early days of, of no, that I remember, model. I it remember was, you it, sharing that with me yeah. uh, way back when, yeah. So we, you know, this is the um, emotional intelligence framework, as it's called, and it starts with underpinned by, you know, these two principles and attitudes. Now, those two attitudes, self-regard and regard for others, also underpin all the other eight mindsets that underpin the model as well. So, you know, people can change is one of them. But for people to change, they have to accept they're a valuable, worthwhile human being and they have the capacity to change. If you think that... I'm no good, I'm incapable, I'm incompetent, I'm worthless, you know, really low self-esteem stuff, then it tend, we tend to build boundaries around our behavior and keep safe and don't take risks, don't move outside our comfort zones. So it stops us changing. Yeah. And there's all, we could talk about this at another event if we want in talking about how those unpack. But those those two street those two foundations lead up to the rest of the model. So for those of you watching this on video, you can see the slide on screen now, which shows the six quadrants of the emotional intelligence model that supports the rest of the framework. So at the very foundation of emotional intelligence is what what we're looking at is self regard and regard for others, which Joe and I have already spoken about. And then on top of that, at the next level up, is your feelings level, which is your self-awareness, 
and your awareness of others. And then on top of that, further still, is looking at your behavioral level, which is looking at your self-management scales, how you self-manage yourself under pressure. So, so talk me through, you know, I, I, you said about transactional analysis, because that's the way I typically explain self-regard, mm. regard for others. That's, mm. the, that's the genius of this mm. model, is that mm. no other model looks at what's shaped us as human mm. beings. Mm. So mm. whenever I, this is the big reveal for everyone that I've ever worked with, Joe, uh, when I'm yeah, looking okay. at their EI uh, report, their profile, yeah. Yeah. The first time, unless they've had therapy, perhaps, yeah. that they're actually looking at their self-regard in terms of how they feel about yeah. themselves, you know, they're, yeah. uh, and, and they're seeing it for the first time on, on paper, you know, mm. it's sort of, mm. it can be quite shocking uh, in a good way, in terms of awareness of how they regard themselves, you know, so they, yeah. they're looking at a screen with a score of, you know, one to 10, 10 yeah. being great, one being not so fantastic in terms of the self-regard and then they're also looking at all the other scales as well but in particular mm. the self-regard is the fundamental piece mm. and then regard for others which equally is on a scale of one to ten so that... i don't know i don't know if you find this jim but when you're coaching somebody using the eip profile which has got 16 different facets to it uh people dive into the self-regard one and you end up getting stuck into that because it's the it's the deepest uh yes. it's most profound and these say it can be the most transformative but it's also the most you know broadest it's also the most complex in a way and it, it taps into all parts of your life and your self self um your self-identity so that's why we have the other scales we could just say let's just deal with self-esteem that's everything everything's connected to it so we'll just do that and you, there are some workshops to do that yes but i think it's too much for people sometimes so this is why we have this model the which why we have the framework is to have an organizing approach to emotional intelligence I'm not a great fan of EI is like the EQ score, you know, like IQ score. You, yes, you've got more yes. of it or less of it, and that's the end of it. I was never a fan of that with IQ either. I think in reality, people have multiple types of capacities and resource intelligence and need to learn to use them. So with e EI, I think there's different facets to it. And you'll find that people are strong in some areas, yes. um, weaker in others. So for example, on this one, you find that some people are very strong on the right side, mm -hmm. but less strong on the left side. So the interpersonal intelligence is great, particularly in the helping professions. Yes. So people who have an orientation towards others, nurses, teachers, therapists, coach, they're very strong very often in those, but they also suffer a little bit on the left side because they're not always paying attention to their own needs. And this obviously has consequences like exhaustion, burnout, underperformance and of course you can't help other people if you're not looking after yourself yeah so we, we often look at this framework in a kind of broad way as a sort of let's see what's what patterns are emerging here or you, you do get people who are strong at a different level so different levels of the onion so some people are very strong and particularly in business you might find this as well when you're coaching leaders they're, they're actually self-managed relationship is pretty strong they're sort of green at the top but they're not really paying aware and they're not, their self-esteem isn't great either, but, and often they're, they're skillful. They know how to play the game or say the right things or do the right presentation, whatever it is, but underneath they're not that fulfilled where they're at. Yeah. No, and no, you're right. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. And do you find these people are often the ones who come for coaching? Cause it's like, Oh, I need to stop now and just reflect on what's going on for me. I, I think they're, they're looking for uh, an improvement in themselves as a leader. So they, mm. they, they get to a certain level in their career and they think mm. actually, I, uh, you know, they, I think they got some sort of awareness. I don't know whether mm. they, it's mm. from conversations I've had mm. with them or mm. whether they've just stumbled across it, but they've mm. wreck it or HR have suggested mm. that they go and yeah. develop their, their mm. emotional intelligence. But you're right in terms of it stems from self-regard. And I, I love using the, you know, the typical scenario I talk about when I talk about self-regard in particular, it being the most important aspect. Mm -hmm. And you're right. You know, we I do spend quite a bit of time discussing and explaining self-regard mm -hmm. in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, obviously, regard for others comes a close second, mm -hmm. but actually self-regard is the mm -hmm. most important scale out of the whole mm -hmm. lot. 
Mm. And and the way I refer that um, and explain that to people is that when we get on board a, a flight anywhere in the world, the first mm. thing they do before they take off is they give us the the safety you know demonstration mm. and you know they typically talk about the oxygen mask and you know put that on yourself first mm. before mm. you help mm. others and it's mm. the same with emotional intelligence your mm. self mm. your self regard needs to be mm. robust needs mm. to be solid before you can help others so yeah. and you know so yeah. a lot of time is spent helping leaders become aware of the importance of that just just to add to that joe someone that has got a high self regard as a leader they need to be conscious that not everyone in their organization, in their mm. team, also have a self yeah. a high self-regard because yeah. Yeah. they they almost just dismiss it as though, yeah, well, you know, that's a sort of a given. Well, it's yeah. not a given. Yeah. Not everyone yeah. has had a similar uh, upbringing as mm. as they mm. might have. Mm. And and what's what I'm interested in understanding is how that shapes. So give me your, you know, your professional uh, oh. view of how, you know, self-regard and then yeah. regard for others, how that shapes. Well, I think the, yeah, the self-regard, I mean, all, all those facets are important. And as you say, if you look at the arrows in this model, they go from the bottom upwards. Yes. Um, so generally speaking, you know, if you can do, but self-regard is interesting because it's not just, uh, it's not a panacea in that you're not necessarily self-regard in every aspect of your life. There will be pockets perhaps where suddenly it dips mm -hmm. uh, scenarios because it's, you know, think of self-regard having, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of transaction analysis, we have a new aspect of self-regard influencing every day. So to some extent, I'm influencing yours now, you're influencing mine, whether we like it or not. Yeah. And you can sometimes be drawn back to a time in your life, childhood very often, where ooh, you get a pattern match with something, you won't even consciously know it, but you just body drops your shoulders drop you feel lacking confidence you don't feel good about yourself because you've triggered something that happened in your life with today with yes. right now and your self-regard has just gone from a 10 to a one and the question is can you get get it back from the one back to the 10 do you know how to do that yeah do you know or you're gonna get stuck and stay in that one so self-regard is is conditional sometimes it will be certain situations and we can look at that when we look at the next 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 matrix which combines these two but mm -hmm. um they everything is influenced by it but i suppose while i was when i was looking at the behavior level i was thinking sometimes it's easier to look at some of the top level top level areas as a way into self-regard so for yeah. example you might look at emotional resilience or goal directedness or flexibility or something else say well maybe that's a practical way of getting into what's going on underneath yeah, okay. um with one scale and I just wanted to add the, I think one of the problems with leadership, and I think you said it, it was people say, oh, how can I be a better leader? What can I do? And they'll give them a set of competencies. And my heart sinks every time I see a competency framework. Um, <laughs> oh, God, yeah. More behaviors that I should adopt. Well, yeah, there's just, and there's hundreds of descriptors, you know, God, the brain can only deal with seven pieces of information anyway at the best. Yeah. So it doesn't tend to work. Competencies are a useful endpoint indicator, you know, focusing on where do you want to get to, but they're not on in themselves are going to lead to the behavior because if they're not congruent with your self-concept, your attitude, then they're not going to last. They're not going to, rather like with the young people, if the young person with maps, you know, that other th that I was talking about, if the young person doesn't have a sense of ambition or belief that they can achieve something, you know, sooner or later, they'll go back to their old behaviors unless you shift that belief that I am somebody who can achieve, even when yeah. things go wrong, I still believe I can achieve stuff. But if you believe you are, aren't you, even when you're successful and you do things well, you still think underneath, well, I got lucky. You'll make excuses. Of course. Um, or it's just, you know, a one-off. Yeah. A one-off. Yeah. The old classic yeah. one-off. So we, we actually just, we, we'd rather hold on to our old attitudes than even if the behavior is inconsistent, than yeah. shift that. So until you shift the underlying self identity, it's very difficult to make those behaviors stick. And that's why we do get below these levels. You know, in, gradually, we don't dive into them. In fact, we start very often with behavior stuff. Then we get into awareness. And then we move into this, this ah, now I see why it's going on. Yeah. But there's no point in going into the, the deep stuff until people are seeing what it's connected to at the top. But there's also not much point in just spending your time doing competency work with people until they understand where it's coming from. Yeah, um, yeah, and and that's what I think is 
uh, so beautiful about the framework is that, okay, so I'm not a therapist, I'm a coach. I know I'm mm, not a therapist. Mm. So I don't try and do a 101 when I'm working with mm. clients. I'm not, not trying to do a 101 psychobabble on them. Mm. You know, I'm not saying this is a couch session. And I know the difference between therapy and coaching, you know, and, and it's really important mm. to make sure mm. that, you know, I think I've had two clients in the last 20 years where I've actually said, actually, this is not a coaching situation. Mm. You, know, you need need a therapist, a professional to help you with some of this mm. stuff. And and I'm, you know, it, it's a, you go where people are comfortable to go mm. Uh, mm. from a coaching. But what your my aim as a coach is to try and help them understand what has shaped them into mm. who they are now mm. and mm. fundamentally self-regard and regard for others is mm. shaped by mm. their mm. their conditioning from their childhood mm. onwards and yeah. and i i deliberately went and did a, a a long weekend it was only a a few days work on transactional analysis and that's uh, just to understand the ei yeah. model in in yeah. more detail yeah and i found yeah. that fascinating i i was mm. blown i was blown away with some of the things i picked up there joe yeah which yeah. i know you take you know you you guys both knew uh, and you probably got more from in terms of from Tim, you know, mm. Tim's involvement. Mm. Mm. But the self-regard piece is so, so fundamental and starts yeah. so yeah. early in life mm. as well. Mm. Yeah. You know, for, from from nine months onwards or something. Yeah. You know, yeah. We start getting conditioned uh, with our self-regard. And that's yeah. all about, you know, uh, when the only way we can communicate as babies is we go, Wah! we cry. Mm. Yeah, you know, yeah. and then if mum or dad picks us up, that's mm. a positive mm. stroke. If they mm. leave us to uh, to cry, that's mm. a negative stroke, mm. and mm. and that gets added to mm. as we uh, mm. become toddlers. It goes from mm. that tactile piece more, mm. and then when we're older and start understanding mm. language, mm. you know, from two and three years old onwards, we start mm. getting the positive strokes verbally. Mm. or not as the case may be mm. oh well mm. done jim you know um we bring our school report home or a picture or a painting or something mm. oh well done or not so well done you know so yeah um, yeah and that starts shaping our self-regard yeah. yeah and that that yeah. gets added to when we go to school and then life yeah. relationships yeah and work so that that's a constant you yeah. know yeah. adding to or taking yeah. away from and mm. and i find that i find that absolutely fascinating yeah and yeah. it's sort of like is like well, duh. Yeah, it's obvious, but it's not oh, obvious. I don't think yeah. people talk, think about that a great no, deal. No, no. And the doorway, the doorway into those concepts of self regard is is the middle part of the framework. So it's like you know, awareness of myself. What's going on for me? Noticing my body. Noticing how I react. How I feel yeah. elated, joyful, or down and sad, or worried, or I've got intuition. All these feelings are informing yeah. us of what's where where of our attitudes of ourself and of what's out out there as well as picking up what's going on for other people and i'll talk a bit more about those two self-regard and regard for others in just one second just want to say that you know so people can get stuck on the behavior bit they can also get stuck on the awareness bit right on this framework which is i get people who love learning and they love just thinking okay and a key part of emotional intelligence is putting ei into action so I, I, I'm a good example of that. I, I know a lot about, as you do, we know a lot about emotional intelligence. We could write a book on it, whatever. Oh, but and it you have. <laughs> and I have. But it doesn't make me the most emotionally intelligent person. Yeah, nor me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not put ourselves down too much. Right? Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> it, it put us together. I think we'd be perfect, actually, Jim. We, yeah, pro- quite possibly. <laughs> we've, got, we've got strength in different areas. Yeah. But that's 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 being a human, isn't it? But what the point here is knowing about it doesn't make you good at it. And true the real it's the combining the awareness level with the behavior level. So okay, I recognize what's going on for me. I've been on all the courses, I've been coached, I've written a book, blah blah blah. But now I'm gonna go away and do something about it. Yeah. So what Schutz did really well is encounter groups. You get people to actually go away and do stuff together in a in a safe environment. And you could be stuck in this, you know, I remember spending four days with a group of people. You're allowed out f- facilities and eating, but that was it. And what happened, happened. But that's a bit extreme. But you, when you go back to the workplace, what's really, really important is people don't just know that oh, I've been in this course, taught some really interesting stuff. Ah, I'm really like this and I'm not like that. And well, well so what? Yeah, What exactly. are you going to do about it? Yeah, exactly. Great. Yeah. 
ah, well, actually, I went on the, the Jim Reese course and he said, blah, 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 and this is what I've got my plan to do. Yeah. And one of the things is to tell you what I'm going to do because that reinforces it, blah, blah, blah. Ah, so, and then after a period of time, it becomes automatic, habitual, and it makes a difference. That's what you really need is combining those two pieces. So this is I often described, you know, the definition of emotional intelligence, is managing your, yourself, which is a top bit, but thinking about your feeling, uh, which is the middle bit, uh, what you do, how you do it. And then the bottom bit, which we're going to come on to now, which is very much why you do this. Yes. Because you, uh, it's reinforced. It's fil- it, everything's filtered through these, this self-concept stuff of your self-regard and your regard for others. If you get all three of those working together, then you, you're onto a dead cert. It'll, it'll be okay. But it's just generally one or two aren't as strong as the others. Yeah. And also you might be strong on the left side or the right side. So this model organizes organizing framework helps us to understand which bits are working well for us and which bits do i need to try a bit work a bit harder at to make it balance and that's the beauty of you know of change it isn't just oh i've got high iq low iq or i've got high self-esteem low self-esteem there's more to it than just that so uh, yeah I, I, let's I, talk about self-regard and regard for others <laughs> yeah let's so uh... I, I've already explained, you know, around the, you know, the the young, you know, it starts very early, uh, nine months old as a, from self-regard perspective. Mm. My understanding from what I took on board from the transactional analysis program that I went on yeah. many years yeah. ago was that regard for others starts getting shaped for around about sort of toddler age where you're, mm. you're, you're walking around. Well, this is what I learned. Jim, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what happens there is you pick up your regard for others via your parents because uh-huh. you're, yeah. you're you're observing how your mum and dad are interacting with other people, yeah. other siblings, yeah. other relatives, yeah. other you know shopkeepers, and when you're out and about, and yeah. you start forming your regard for other people uh, yeah. Yeah. through through mum and dad, and then mm-hmm. of course that gets shaped further as you go to school yeah. and via teachers, etc. Yeah. That makes but, uh, yeah really interesting. To hear that, I've not heard that time frame exactly. I mean, I don't think we know, do we? But I, I mean, no. I think Eric Byrne, he's a yeah. founder of TA and others, you know, Fritz Perls, Gestalt psychologist. Uh, many would say also, you know, from the day, even before we're born, depending on what's happening in the, as, a, as a mother, you yeah. know, um, forms are, and certainly the Human Givens, which, we, you know, it's another framework I really like, Human Givens Institute, and they talk about, everything everything you know our patterns in our brain are being formed before we're born so we have instincts innate innate resources Mm. responses so when we come into the world we're not just nothing we know to suck on a a, a nipple shaped object otherwise we'd starve we know to cry we don't consciously know it but it's our way of survival so and you know all all living organisms have this capacity to survive so something is implanted before we're even born obviously from the very moment we open our eyes we hear stuff our senses are alive there's stuff going into our brain yeah so i'm i mean and the first experiences we have as you mentioned the word strokes which is a term for attention you know people kind to us horrible to us loud noises good noises how does it make us feel Mm. you know i mean we're born into the world uninvited just yeah. <laughs> down we come and every experience we encounter is going to shape us and fundamentally we have these questions according to this model it's just am i okay am i safe am i valued am i likable am i and is everyone else okay yeah, yeah. so this is the work of thomas harris uh, the okay corral as it became known yeah um and I, you know this makes absolute sense really that and every encounter we have, every unit of attention we get from anybody or anything will somehow inform that. And it could be positive or it could be negative. It could be verbal, nonverbal, but it's going to shape our self okayness and our okayness about the world. And a lot of that, I think, is unconscious and it still triggers us. You know, there's no chance in the world you'll ever have a perfect upbringing. It just no. doesn't, it can't happen. Well, yeah, um, exactly. You know, they tried hot housing children. That didn't work either. You know, trying to be, <laughs> they all ended up messed up. So, <laughs> but we, I, th- I always think that as long as we're very good at picking up intention 
Are, is somebody on us? Is a friend or foe? We've got this instinct to know whether somebody loves us or hates us or is okay with us. And as long as you have that, this is what Tim taught me anyway, psychotherapist, that as long as you have somebody in your life who fundamentally unconditionally loves you, yeah. you're okay. Whatever you do, then you will feel you're a lovable person. And yeah, there'll be people who don't and there'll be hot, nasty things that happen to you. But deep, deep down, you know, if you feel that you are likable, valuable, worthwhile, and there have been episodes in your very early life that have supported that, then you'll have something to rest upon. And, uh, you know, this isn't getting into therapy, but fundamentally, I think nearly all people really do. And people who don't have so much of it get can get it in later life and so forth. But why this is important, of course, is it manifests later in our responses in life. So... Yeah, self-regard is a degree, it's defined as a degree to which we value and accept ourselves unconditionally. Yeah. yeah. And regard for others is the same, but towards others. The degree to which we value and accept others unconditionally. And the important word there is unconditional. Yeah, I mean it could that that is a whole episode by itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unconditional love, you know. How many occasions have we been in a relationship, you know, as as, yeah. as adults in, in yeah. a space, in a relationship that is unconditional? Because actually, when you start picking through it, you think, yeah, yeah actually, yeah, you're only going to do that if if I do these things, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's but so it, funny. It, but because we bring ourselves, we bring our whole life to this time right now. Me yeah. talking to you, you're triggering off good stuff, but it might be, you know, something else another day. And certainly if you live with somebody and, I don't know, they don't do the washing up or something, that might be triggering something. I got told off as a kid for not doing mm -hmm. something. Anything could happen. It's yeah. so vulnerable. Yeah. Um, but as long as we start recognising our this sort of, you know, uh, vulnerability and we're not going to get it right and we've got strategies for dealing with it, you know, it, it can it can work. Of course it yeah, can. Yeah, of course. But it, can, you, it can not work as well. If, you, if you're courageous, I think that's the thing. I think it's uh, if you're... Yeah courageous enough to be vulnerable i think vulnerable is a yeah a, i mean there's a lot being written and and spoken about in terms of mm. being vulnerable you know brene brown's work on mm. um, you know her stuff around mm. being vulnerable i find it a, a brilliant piece you know can mm. you be uncomfortable you know can you be comfortable being uncomfortable yeah you know, have, having the conversations you know being mm. able to have those conversations that you might do might, might need to have um, mm. with your partner or, or in a relationship mm. with your kids with your colleagues at work uh, with your subordinates mm. are you okay to have those conversations because of course you you know as well as I do Joe that a lot of leaders avoid those difficult conversations yeah. you know so someone that's not performing well they can't even have the conversation yeah. uh, and don't give them the the appropriate yeah. feedback for that individual to then grow yeah and this is the word unconditional. It's okay not to be okay. It's become yes. quite a trendy phrase now. But it, it literally, what do you really mean by that? Uh, acceptance of others. Now, acceptance of yourself, first of all. Mm -hmm. Vulnerability. Hands up. I messed up. And I, I, you know, but it requires a certain level of openness and courage and willingness to say, yeah, I've sort of thought about this. And I was really, you know, when I've calmed down, it's always better to try to calm the emotional brain down so you can think more clearly says so yeah there's stuff there for me i don't know what it is but it's not it's not a nice part it's not something i like about myself or about this relationship or about me as a leader and i want to do something about it that's but saying uh, the true true self-regard is saying i don't hate myself because of it i'm i'm okay with not being perfect i'm okay with yeah. you know not always getting it right or pleasing everybody all the time or everybody liking me or even i'm okay with not liking myself i mean it sounds contradictory but ultimately i'm okay with warts and all yeah yeah and i like that warts yeah. and all um, mm. description i know i know i've gone through phases and i'm sure you have too joe where i've not been particularly nice to myself mm. you know mm. i I, mm. I can do self-deprecation mm. uh, in, mm. in a really mm. good way you know like mm. i almost get the whip out and like mm. you know mm. Mm. Uh, you know that wasn't particularly good and beat myself mm. up for it but actually yeah. yeah i don't hold on to it for too long yeah you know, and then I might come back to it a, a year or two later and yeah. think, oh, yeah. hang on, <laughs> I'm doing the same thing I was doing a couple of years ago. Yeah, but you've got your strategies and maybe as we get older and wiser, we learn 
other ways of you know but it's probably you know there's stuff and some of it we just don't know where it's come from maybe we yeah. don't need to know um and i'm not saying you know this is a this really isn't the panacea it's not saying that be emotional in your life and everything will be perfect because it's accepting imperfection i think for me yeah a lot of it is is accepting you're okay despite that doesn't mean you can't change these things if you choose to uh, but it just requires truth, openness with with yourself to say, yeah, this is something I really want to work on and I'm going to do something uh, about it. I heard a phrase recently, uh, actually, which completely encompasses what you're just talking about there, which is, you know, I am perfectly imperfect, you know, mm. and being OK with that. And mm. Mm. The, the the OK, being OK with yourself is the fundamental base that you mm. need to then be able to yeah. be OK yeah. with others. Yeah. And it's it's one thing to say it, isn't it? It's another thing to feel it because it's self regard isn't actually a behaviour; it's a feeling, yes. it's a state. Unlike the others, where you can see, oh, that person's motion resilient. Look at how they behave, or goal directed, and look what they achieve. Mm-hmm. Self regard is you don't really know it. In fact, you can see somebody who's quite the opposite. They 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 stand on stage, look like a million dollars, and have a mass, a wonderfully confident presentation, or whatever it is. But deep down, they feel like an awful worm now self-regard is 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 a state and you can manage your state but it will come back to you yeah um and you know i, th- I think and, and a good way of thinking about unconditional regard is particularly for, for other people uh, is is for, it's think about your own somebody you you care about like your own child you really love and it, regardless of what they do you may tell them off you may be unhappy with their behavior you don't just ignore stuff when it goes wrong you say, oh, i love you anyway doesn't do what you want it's not about that it's about that wasn't acceptable that wasn't good enough um, yeah. i'm going to give you feedback and the reason i'm doing it is because i come from a place i i care about you i yeah. want the best for you and as as a human we are very good at telling whether somebody is is on our side or not whether they are trying to be there for our benefit and, you know, I, I always think about, you know, my own son growing up, God, you know, hard work like any any child. But of course, I un- that was one example for me. I had unconditional acceptance, love for, even though sometimes I was very, even very angry. Yeah. But there's a difference in unconditionality and behavior. Yeah. The behavior may be unacceptable. The, con- the unconditional, the feeling you have in your body towards that person doesn't fundamentally change. Yeah. The same yeah, yeah. could be towards yourself. Funny, I still feel I'm an O deep down, despite all the things I've done or I do, I still owe okay with myself. And if you, you know, that's not an easy place to get to necessarily, but it doesn't mean you, you can feel very forgiving, but it doesn't mean you never want to improve or change or develop yeah. yourself. So ch- separating doing from being is a really key part of self-regard and regard for others. It separates them from the other scales. The other scales are largely behavior things. This one is, very much a feeling thing yeah no i i, I like it i like it mm. I, I i i think it's just a stroke of genius that it's available mm. um for people to be able to um look at their emotional intelligence profile mm. and work out okay so what is my self-regard like and what's mm. my regard for others i, mm. I remember mm. you, you said that for some years you used to use my profile which i was okay with when you're sharing it with uh, groups that you were training in, in the tool itself, you know, so yeah. I, I remember way back then, you know, when I, when I took my first um, profile, my questionnaire, mm. I had less of a self-regard. So I had mm. a lower self-regard than mm. I did regard mm. for others. And you mm. go back to, you know, people predominantly that are in the helping mm. world, you mm. know, like yourself, myself, and, you know, doctors, nurses, etc., mm. tend to have a higher regard for others. And although my regard, my self-regard has grown over the years, mm. they, my regard for others is still stronger. It's become yeah. more equal now, more balanced. Um, yeah, yeah. More. And I suppose that's a th- feature of the profile, isn't it? It can You can actually get different scores uh, at different times. It's not a trait. It's not personality. It's about yeah. how what's going on for you, you know, the current time in your life. And so maybe maybe talk about, a little bit, if you don't mind, Joe, um, you've re- referenced it a couple of times, the the model, the OK Corral, where, you know, depending on how you score 
re with regards to yourself so your self-regard and your mm. regard for others and then putting mm. them on the quadrant so maybe mm. if you can explain this mm. particular mm. slide that we're, yeah. we're going to have a look at now talk to me about this this particular framework again this comes from uh, one of the humanistic models transactional analysis uh -huh. uh, the work of thomas harris the okay corral but it all goes back to you know eric burns work and carl rogers work a uh, sense of unconditional unconditional positive regard towards yourself or towards others and uh if you combine those two facets which i think you said you know other tools don't particularly focus on well they might have self-regard but they tend not to look at regard for others and if they have one or the other they don't combine them and it's this blend, it's this uh, relationship between those two life orientations. And in fact, these are called life positions, if you look at what was yeah. originally called the OK Corral, mm -hmm. because they orientate our attention. They determine much of our behavior. And actually, you might ask, if you want to ask, why am I behaving this way? You could say, well, what are your, what's, what life position are you in? Yes. Yeah. What part of this framework are you in at that time? Yeah. And you can move, you can move around it. And it can have different levels of intensity as well. You could be right in the corner. You could be near the middle, a bit more balanced. And that will be popping up depending on pattern matches, you know, rep past experiences you've had that are being reflected by your present situation. And whether you like it or not, your brain just does this all the time. It's always triggering off past experiences, fueling, which triggers off and fuels feelings and thoughts in our body. So sometimes you do have to go back if it keeps happening, saying, actually, what's triggering this? How could I change that response? Yeah. Uh, shift my mindset. And this is the deepest one. It doesn't have to be, you know, you could be talking about trust or my ability to change. It could be an attitude towards lots of things. But this is the one that holds them all together. Yeah. And so when you're coaching somebody, you often find people will come back to this one as a sort of overarching picture of what's going on. So, yeah, you've used this a lot, haven't you, in coaching, Jim? I, I, I think this, <laughs> this, this piece, I, I do spend quite a bit of time on this. And, and in terms of explaining it from a perspective of, you know, no one ever scored. I've very rarely, I don't think I've ever come across anyone that scored a 10 and a 10. So a 10 on self-regard and a 10 for regard for others. So it's a, it's a blend, you know, and ideally... A balanced blend is the best way to, you know, so if you've, if they've scored a five and then a five on regard for others is, is better than having a, a five for self-regard and one for regard for others. Yeah. And, and as you can see on this framework, you know, you've, you've got different labels in each of those mm. boxes, mm. but ideal is obviously in the top right quadrant. Just, uh, just explain to us, you know, the differences. So, You've got, you've got, um, just yeah, I'll talk you through it. I mean, I mean, these, these, this is called the attitude matrix. It comes from the emotional intelligence profile report. Yes. Uh, I should say, I mean, the history of this is it was originally with JCA, uh, uh -huh. 25 years, myself and John. And then we, um, we were acquired, the company was acquired by Talogy, yes. uh, which PSI before that. Now it's called Talogy. So this is, the, these are distributed through Talogy as a questionnaire, as well as the models, um, which underpin all of this. I always think yeah, a good which, questionnaire. Um, I was just going to say, which I still use, you know, I mean, that, that yeah. I, I still am really passionate about the model, the framework, the the robustness yeah. that yourself and Tim put into all those years ago and mm. continue to reiterate and, yeah. you know, various versions. It, it of does that. evolve. And, and you know, yeah. there's a lot of other work we've done. You know, I, I've, I've not, not with Talogy anymore, but I certainly spent five years working with Talogy and developing a lot of ideas around this. Um, and linking it to other approaches. And, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that we developed the team indicator. So there's also the team model. Yeah. There's also an organizational climate tool called the leadership climate indicator. And all of these measure the, measure the emotional intelligence uh, of the organization, of the team, of the individual. And they're all, you know, the stick of rock, if you like, that goes through is, e is EI. So, yeah, as I say, the important point there is, you know, they, they're, they're all available. You can train with Talogy and um, there's various questionnaires. But this is this comes up, this two by two matrix comes up in your report later on. Yes. And the one to 10 scale is based on STENs, which are standard. Ten. So it's a one to 10 and a normal distribution. So most people score four, five, six in the middle. Yeah. Most of us in any statistics are in the middle. It's less likely you get to the extremes. This is an artifact of the scoring of the questionnaire. So 
So you get few and few people at the extremes. I would just add, though, with self-regard, it's a hard one to measure. Don't get too hung up if you're a one or a ten. You know, don't mm-hmm. think, oh, it's all sorted because, or it's the end of the world. Either way, well, you can if you choose, but I wouldn't. No, no, um, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's 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 a it's a basically it's a stake in the ground. It's where you are right now. Uh, which doesn't mean that if you do score lower than a five or a six or whatever, uh, Mm -hmm. the average scores, if you're Mm -hmm. a one or a two, you Mm -hmm. can improve. And I've seen that with some of my clients over the years, which has been quite remarkable to see the Mm -hmm. transformation. Mm -hmm. But you're right. You're so right. Don't get too caught up in the score itself. It's a stake in the ground. It's where you're at now. Let's focus on what you want to do about it, which is goes back to your point. So, okay, so what are you going to do about it? So almost yeah. like a godfather. Hey, what are you going to do about it? You know, uh, <laughs> but it is, isn't it? It's a bit like that. It's um, so you play the role really well, Jim. <laughs> uh, I need a bit of cotton wool in my mouth. I just one thing I I ask clients when I'm when I'm coaching with the this self regard stuff is you know there's three ways levels of self regard there's how are you feeling right now yeah. talking to me the gestalt in this moment how are you feeling and I, say, oh, I feel terrible these results are upsetting me I'm feeling yes. good because you're quite energizing Jim you know make me feel good so I might be a ten right now because uh, I'm loving this conversation but actually when I did the questionnaire I was reflecting over the last you know few weeks. And things have been going pretty okay, but I've had a few difficulties and challenges. My work's not going so well. Personal life's going better. And, you know, and so I've gave myself a six. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if you ask me another question, which is fundamentally, what's your, which, which is your life position? Which one do you tend to defer to? Yes. Thinking back to your childhood, throughout your life, what's been your pattern? And uh, honestly, I think, you know, I tend to spend a lot of time feeling in the submissive. I always defer to people that put myself down a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm healthy a bit of time, but I tend to that's my default position. So there's different levels of looking at self-regard and regard for others. Yeah. And it could be you, the questionnaire could pick up on any of those. It could be recently. It could be your life position or it could be just right. Right. In the moment you completed it. You, mm-hmm. you had an argument with the kids and you 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 hammered the questionnaire nick yes so just just bear that in mind when you're looking at these two because there's more to it than just your score and that's why i always say i think well on this diagram we show it as a blue ball and i always say this blue ball can move in fact you will spend time everyone i've ever coached anyway spent time in all four positions sometime they do yeah it might be you don't spend much time in the you know the block position um, but you may you know, you probably be times when you do. And you may only spend a minute in there and just move out. So, I mean, I had a pattern where I'd sort of zigzag between them. So the block position is low low self-regard, low regard for others. And you're just feeling pretty, uh, oh, you know, even talking about it makes you feel a bit low. <laughs> Giving up, helpless, resigned. Why do I bother? Blaming others, blaming yourself and, you know, hands up in the air. And it might be just something's happened. You think, oh, I've tried everything I can. Nobody's helping me. I'm feeling rubbish and I just want to quit. Maybe the end of the day. Go and you don't want to be around people either at that, at that you don't point. Want, yeah, yeah, it could be. You're I mean, peopled that's not, out. Yeah, I mean, that's not the, you know, that's probably near the middle rather than the extreme. Mm-hmm. If I was in the extreme, that would be probably get into the de- feelings of depression or you know, anxiety. And really, particularly if you stay there for a long time, then, yeah. then that's more concerning. But, you know, it's quite normal to fall into that box. But then I, you know, sometimes I think, oh, well, in fact, it's not me, it's them. <laughs> um, they just don't get it. You know, yeah. they don't see the world I see. And and in fact, when I'm training, sometimes I get quite critical. I think, well, I, you know, if I did a, a bad presentation, people didn't buy into it. I thought I might feel bad about myself, but actually I sometimes start thinking, well, you know, it's, it's, I mean, actually, normally I go into the submissive position, first of all, which is I start beating myself up. To, yeah. I just didn't do, you know, I didn't get it right. I might go into the, the down position, the, the block position where I beat, beat myself up, but then I get critical. I start blaming others sometimes. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be there for very long. Sometimes I might have just got out the wrong side of bed in the morning and I just feel a bit blamey. Yeah. Or when my son doesn't, you know, do his chores, I start feeling, and I think, oh, God, uh, sort of built, escalating it in my head. And actually he comes down with chat and like, actually, it's not that bad after all. So you can move yeah. out of that position as well. But the thing to bear in mind with the critical position is this is where you're, I'm okay, it's you that's got the problem. Yeah, 
it's a it's a common defense we use because it makes me while I'm doing that and pointing the finger at you yeah I, I don't have to look pointed at me and I don't feel bad about myself but I, I feel better almost and this is what defenses do they temporarily give us a sense of relief yeah. they temporarily give us a break and it works the reason I adopted this defense of blaming getting it can be uh, the danger is it becomes compulsive and you don't stop doing it yeah you spend your t- entire life being angry uh, with people the world well, um, and that's that's what happens with I've I've seen over the years that people are, you know, if they're in that blocked space, which yeah. you used to call yeah. stuck, you used yeah. to call it stuck. Yeah. And I, I think blocked's a better way uh, to mm-hmm. describe it. But they blame their partner, they blame their kids, they blame their boss, they blame yeah. the government, they blame yeah. everyone apart from taking personal responsibility yeah. themselves. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. If you stay there for too long. It mm. becomes a, a vicious cycle and gets stuck in that same pattern. Yeah. And it, of course it works. That's why we have these. I mean, you've got to ask the question, why do you do it? Our brains are rational things, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> it seems it, the brain's worked out that maybe when I was bullied in the playground, the best way was to be really aggressive back. So uh, it worked for me. It kept me safe. So there's a reason. Why did you adopt yeah. it? And then they ask the next question, is it still working for you? Yes. Uh, is this going to is it still the best way of behaving now you've grown up or yeah no i love that question that's yeah. great is, yeah so how's that working out for you right now <laughs> yeah, yeah how's that working like, out? <laughs> i don't want to know that i don't want to know it's the way you ask it sarcastically yeah, you know. yeah exactly yeah oh well i mean i've been having six <laughs> months of therapy and it's <laughs> exactly but yeah it's it's clearly it's, you know it doesn't it never works anyway it's insatiable but it doesn't work for us it, it just it gives us short term benefit mm-hmm. until eventually because the reason we feel like that is actually because it's something i'm avoiding about myself yes i don't think people like me or people don't care about me or people are out to harm me or i'm i don't feel competent or capable what you know those horrible painful feelings we want to avoid that we've had and they may not be true of course they're just ones we've uh, we've somehow picked up throughout our life so it works but it doesn't help us in the long run and as soon as you start raising awareness which is the point of this ah i see where it's coming from this isn't working out for me it comes because i just had a really bad day and i feel cross with everybody else but it's because i had a i noticed every time i get cross it's because i had a bad day myself or something went yes. wrong so it's more to do with me and that is why sometimes in order to improve, get out of the critical position, you need to start raising awareness, which takes you into the submissive position. Mm-hmm. Because by definition, you're recognizing it's me. Yeah, There's something going on for me. And for a short while, you may start feeling bad about yourself. But don't feel that's a bad thing to place to be. That's probably the right place to be because it's a step forward. Yeah, it's a step out of that critical. It's a recognition where it's come from. Mm-hmm. And in order to move forward, being in the submissive position where you say, actually, I mean, don't linger in there. Don't start beating yourself up, but recognizing there's something going on. If you have, once you get to the position of acceptance, unconditional regard for yourself, there's a sense of it's okay to be there. Yeah, yes. It's okay to not feel okay. It's okay to have made these mistakes in your life. It's okay that other people don't, like what you've done just accept value yourself because and think about yourself as a child even Mm -hmm. would you beat yourself up as a child you know that's where it's come from yeah kind compassionate and once you see that and there's a sort of sense oh god yeah i really do need to sort of move out of that and once once you get that acceptance automatically we move into the healthy position Mm -hmm. because our, our regard for ourselves has gone up we may not like all the behaviors and we accept but we're accepting them we're accepting ourselves. Yeah, I like I like that reference. Others. I like that reference, Joe, to thinking of yourself as a little child, because of course, mm. you know, a lot of this stuff is what we're talking about ultimately is your inner child. You know, we all have mm. an inner child. Mm. And that and that the inner child is, you know, jumping up and down trying to get attention. Mm. Um, mm. so mm. you know, what would you how would you take care of that little child if they were acting and behaving in this way? Mm. Can you just mm. give them a hug, you know, and and, you know, that's that's a great way of thinking about it is to give your inner child, your own personal inner child, a hug, you know, because that's what it needs. It needs to yeah. Yeah. have a little bit of love. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really, you know, there's a load of good stuff out there nowadays on well-being and compassion and acceptance yeah. and stuff. And this is where this kind of stuff really, really helps people, I think. Yeah. Um, 
Um, but it does take, it can be a bit of a painful process. And you don't have to linger there. You could just get into one of the EIP scales, for example, and look at, you know, trust. You mm -hmm. know, if it's about relationships, oh, actually, I need to focus on trust. It's a bit more manageable than maybe this stuff at yes. that, for that person at that time. Yeah. But you, you indirectly, you're dealing with this by talking about trust or mm -hmm. teamwork or something else. And people, so the point here is people will move between those positions and it could be just, it could be quite deep or it could be more surface based and quick and, you know, yeah. not beating yourself up, but we're constantly trying to move back and spend time in the healthy position. And I, I quite like the earlier reference as well in the conversation that we ha were, ha were having is the triggers. You spoke about triggers. There's been some great stuff written mm -hmm. about, oh, well, mm -hmm. there's a book by, um, I think it's uh, goodness me, I'm not going to remember the the chap's name. That's written mm. a book of, uh, called Triggers, which is very very powerful. It was Marshall Goldsmith that wrote the book, and he describes in great detail the various triggers that we all run as human beings. But Joe, I mean, this is this is it's so easy to have this conversation. I suppose <laughs> predominantly mm. because we're both passionate about this. Mm. And I, I think we could go on and on and on uh, yeah, for this yeah. first episode. And, and, yeah, I, and I'm yeah. conscious that actually listeners can stop and start. And I think it might be useful if we maybe just uh, come to a conclusion mm, on this episode. Mm, yeah. And uh, and in the second episode, maybe just revisit this and mm, before we get back into mm, the other levels of the emotional intelligence framework, mm, if that's mm, okay with you. Yeah. And it's and it's been an absolute pleasure to do this, and I'm I'm looking forward to our next episode where we can dive mm. into mm. this in in a in a, in a deeper way. And mm. I like the idea of you being able to bring some of those examples uh, as mm. well, mm. which is mm. fantastic. So I'm mm. really grateful mm. that you've been able to join me here today, mm. and look forward to our next episode where we'll mm. do a, a sort of a review and mm -hmm. then go deeper into the model the the other scales the yeah, other ten, yeah the other skin 10 scales so the the self-awareness scale the the self uh, awareness of others yeah, and then go yeah. into the relationship management and the self-management yeah. uh, tools yeah. because yeah. you've you've touched on some of those yeah but again this is something that i think mm. would be our listeners would be really interested in understanding mm. yeah. uh, in more detail and it certainly helps that um you know when we talk if you've listened to this podcast first of all then you'll be able to put these uh separate parts of emotional intelligence into the overarching model uh, yeah. so they won't just be standalone points because they're obviously not it's all all connected mm. and we, we didn't talk about your book but i'm i know can you just share your book joe you it's emotional intelligence at work yeah but you've yeah. got a copy of it there can you yeah. just yeah so for those that are uh, watching this they can uh, get a copy of joe's book I'm um, not sure whether Amazon's the best place or whether there's a better place. Joe. I believe it's on Amazon. Yeah. You can get okay. it from And certainly if you train in the questionnaire with 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 them, then they include a copy of the book. Perfect. Um, so it's, it's certainly available. I mean, yeah, if you're really intrigued by some of the things, this, and it really, it's unpacked in quite a lot of detail. It's not a, it's not a novel, so you don't read it page to page, but you can dive into the bits that are particularly relevant to what we're and, uh, discussing. Yeah, absolutely. And the reason I wanted you to share it is that it does give you some how-tos, you know, so you yeah. are specifically talking about the how-to. So you've got yeah. the awareness, yeah. and it's it's a bit, that is the classic. It's you've got yeah. the awareness, it's what you then do with the awareness yeah. that is yeah. the bit that is going to make the difference. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I know in your book as well, Joe, that, there's quite a bit of data that sort of references the mm. the data for the argument um, for mm. you know organisations investing more of their yeah. uh, budget yeah. on you know developing emotional intelligence yeah. for their leaders yeah. and for their yeah. teams. Yeah. So that's something that we can have a, a look at as well because yeah, uh, yeah. I know it's there and we, we'll tr try and update that as best we can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a whole business case in the book, and we've got a white paper which is more even more up to date. So yeah. There's plenty of resources we can draw upon um, for the appropriate podcast. This is, I suppose, more theoretical background stuff for for those who want to understand where it's come from yeah. um, before we get into the 
maybe the how to yeah 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 a lot quite a lot of how to's i'm uh, i'm yeah. really excited yeah. about that so mm-hmm. look just again thanks ever so much for uh being here on the podcast for mm-hmm. this these series of episodes joe mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. i look forward to um catching you soon in the, maybe in next week's session as well yeah yeah great thanks okay. jim i appreciate Perfect. it okay okay bye bye Take care. well that's a wrap for this week's episode thank you for listening Remember to share and subscribe to the EI Guru podcast. And if you have any questions, you can post them once you've subscribed. You can follow me on Instagram at the EI Guru. And you can get more information from my website, the EIGuru.com. Have a fantastic week. Bye for now.